So my name is Alistair and I work for Western Digital and I'm going to go over an uh, update of the RISC V software status. So for anyone who, who doesn't know, I'll quickly go over what RISC V is. So it's not an open CPU, it's an open ISA. Uh, so that's a, it's a big distinction that, that comes up. So only the ISA is, is open. Um, obviously, it's a RISC ISA uh, from the name. And the way the ISA works is, is a very, very small base ISA, uh, which can come in 32-bit, 64-bit, or, or theoretically 128-bit as well. Um, and so normally that'll have an I or an E, which I is for, for just integer, and E is for embedded, which is a, a slightly smaller version. Um, the base ISA is, is not super useful. Um, it's about 20 instructions. So generally, there's the standard extensions, they call them in RIS-5. So the M, the A, the F, and the D are the most common. And those ones all together are called G in general. Um, so you'll see sometimes people talk about compiler ports and things like that, and they'll say this is RV64G, and that means that it has atomics, multiply and divide, and floating point support. Uh, there's a lot of, so those ones on the, the second line, the multiply, atomic, floating point, they're all frozen. So that means they're, you can use them today and there won't be any changes to how they work. So the spec is still changes a little bit to clarify things, but, but in general, they're not gonna be changing around behind you and, and anything you have today will still work in the future. So there are other ones as well that aren't frozen, that they're still in draft state. So like virtualization, vector support, bit manipulation, things like that. So there are, are draft specs out now you can read. If you, if you wanted, you could implement them, but, but there's no guarantee that between now and when, they're, when they are frozen, they won't change. So RISC-V is really targeted from everything. By using this extension mechanism, they can target everything from tiny little embedded computers to high performance computing. Um, and so that's, where, that's why they have these layers, so you can kind of pick and choose what you want. There are multiple CPU implementations available. So Sci-5 are the main one, or one of the big ones. They have hardware CPUs. Uh, they're the only ones. But there's also things like Boom, which is the Berkeley out of order machine. Um, and there's a few other open source and closed source implementations. And so RISC-V is currently heavily backed by, by Sci-5, the, the startup that makes the silicon, MicroSemi, NVIDIA and Western Digital all have announcements around RISC-V and are investing in it. So how can you use it? So there's two options. Today there's QMU support. Uh, QMU support's fully upstream and was included in, in a few releases now actually, but, but the 3.0 release really is where it, it kind of works. So if you have access to QMU 3.0, you can boot a RISC-V machine pretty easily. Um, and the other option is hardware. So you can see here on the bottom, this kind of smaller square with the ethernet and the power is the Hi5 Unleashed board. It's a, uh, a board that comes with uh, the Hi5, uh, sci 5 U54, and it's the only ASIC chip that can boot Linux today. Um, and the board itself just comes with basically just SD and ethernet. So it's not super useful but then you can plug in a micro semi expansion board, which is what you see on the top three quarters of that picture. And that gives you PCIe, SATA, uh, it also has USB ports, HDMI, a whole uh, arrangement of things, but not all of them work. It's an FPGA board, so it depends on what the bitstream setup to do. But you can see here, we have two PCIe cards plugged in, one, for, one with a GPU, one with USB, uh, so we have in, uh, input, and then there's a SMR drive and also a M2 drive plugged in on the bottom, which you can't see. So it, it boots a full, oh, I'll show you a bit later, but it boots a full Linux operating system and it really runs like a full computer. So RISC-V is very active. Uh, you can kind of see here a general scale of it all coming along. Um, so with that activity, it means it's constantly changing. So if I say something today doesn't work, Next week, if you're interested, go double check because it, it might have changed between now and then. It, stuff is getting upstreamed all the time, forks are popping up. It, there, there is a lot of work around it and a lot of excitement. So you can kind of 
get a general idea that pretty much everything you need to build works. GCC, Binya Tools, glibc, everything's there. You can today start developing with upstream work. You don't need to waste your time getting weird folks of GCC that sometimes work, and everything's there. But on that note, <laughs> the, the kernel still doesn't boot on mainline. So there are forks. Uh, there's a sci five, uh, sorry, a RIS5 fork that does work. Uh, the 4.19 kernel will boot on QMU. So we're RC4 now. So now when, and at release, that's going to work. Uh, the plan is, and the hope is, the 4.20 kernel will boot on the Hi5 Unleashed. So all the core kind of work is there. The thing we're missing now are sci fi related device drivers. So that's being, I mean, they exist, they're just not upstream. There's a big push by a lot of companies to get this up there. Um, so the other stuff I think we'll talk about in the next slide. So there's a lot of ongoing work. Um, so Western Digital specifically is looking at SBI. So for anyone in, uh, who knows about the ARM world, it's kind of similar to PSCI. So things to control the power management of the CPUs and, and stuff like that. So it does exist now, but it's not very expansive. And now we have a trouble of how do you make it better while also not breaking the existing implementations. And so there's draft specs coming out now. <laughs> the second one, the decoupling the heart ID from the, C from the Linux CPU ID is because the Hi5 Unleashed, the zero CPU, is actually a small embedded power controller. It doesn't boot Linux. And so Linux has a lot of trouble when the first or the zero CPU doesn't work. <laughs> so they we're working on that. Uh, there's a few other stuff. So making changes to BBL, which is the Berkeley bootloader. At, currently, it's really the only fully working bootloader that will boot Linux. Uh, I'll talk about that a little later as well. And then there's other companies working on things like upstreaming the Unleashed board work. Uh, a kernel CI work is underway and floating point support for systems without the floating point extensions. So there's still a lot to do. Uh, you can see there a lot of around virtualization, which I'll talk about a little bit as well, and, and bootloaders. So for anyone interested, we always need more people, and this is a great way of getting started. It kind of shows you where all the current trees are, where to talk to on IRC, and where to send patches. So if you guys feel like getting involved, there's some information. So bootloaders are one of the kind of the core missing things at the moment. So we have this thing called Berkeley Bootloader, or BBL. Um, it, it really just gets you going. It doesn't allow any of the full options that, say, a full-grown bootloader like U-Boot or Grub2 will. Uh, this is a huge pain because the the Hi5 Unleashed board puts the device tree in the firmware. And so if you're trying to change anything related to device trees, you quickly end up with a huge hassle of, in, in this little bootloader, trying to change the device tree before it gets passed to Linux. Otherwise, Linux will get upset with the CPU IDs being in the wrong order and things like that. Um, so I think this slide's a little outdated already. So HP, apparently we're working on a UEFI shell that couldn't boot Linux, and Grub2 and U-Boot work are underway, uh, all by Alexander Graf, who works for SUSE. But I think the last I heard is this actually is working now and can boot Linux. Um, yeah, I'm getting nods. So, so I think this slide's a little out of date, and, and we do have UEFI and, and U-Boot support at the moment. I'm not sure if it's all upstream, though. Okay, I'm getting shrugs. I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, Alex isn't here. So virtualization. So virtualization is a big player now, um, and RISC V doesn't have it. <laughs> so there is a spec, there's a draft spec. You can go and read it there. There's a GitHub link where the manual is. Um, it's all kind of written down, it's flashed out, but it's not, like I said before, it's not frozen. So if you implemented it now, there's absolutely no guarantee that what you have now will work in a year's time. So there are ongoing discussions with people of the Zen and the KVM community. So they're not just kind of rushing ahead and doing it themselves. They're working with some key hypervisors, but it's unfortunately secret, or fairly secret, what the work, how the, the specs are ratified. And so we don't have a huge amount of insight into that. And so QMU, so I mentioned before, 
that QMU support is there, it boots Linux, it'll run your bare metal applications, everything's kind of there. Um, but some stuff is missing. So it doesn't, it kind of sounds bad, but everything's missing from every architecture in QMU. Not all the ARM support there, not all the x86 supports there. It's just, it's all, it's all, some of it's just not worth it, right? If, if there's things in these CPUs that no one has ever used and we don't bother implementing in QMU. So an example of that is this MT and ST value registers on a legal instruction should be populated with, I think it's either the PC or the address of the instruction. And they don't do that now, it just is zero. So it's, it's not there, but it's, it's not something that comes up and it's not a problem you'll run into. But one of the other big lacks, or big missing features in QMU is the, the sci-fi boards. So right now they're the only physical boards and QMU has a great vert machine, which is using the vert IO drivers and all the vert IO devices and that works, but there's no good model of the whole sci-fi board. So you couldn't say get something and test it on QMU to then work exactly on the sci-fi board because we don't have all the devices modeled there. Um, and in QMU, a big problem is the lack of reviewers. There's only two of us, and one of them works for a startup, so he's always busy. So if anyone knows a QMU and is interested, come and help review things. But on the good news on the QMU front, uh, so QMU, before everything I've talked about, is running RISC V on a different architecture. So on your host x86 machine, you can run RISC V. QMU also allows you to go the other way around. So on your RISC-V machine, you can run x86 applications or x86 OS. So that's not fully supported yet. There is an outer tree work, but doesn't work fully. But QMU has this thing called TCI. Um, so it's, QMU uses TCG, tiny code generator, to generate instructions. And TCI is the TCG... Um, Interpreter, yeah, and TCG interpreter, that's the word. Uh, and so it kind of interprets the instructions into intermediate form to then go to the host form. It's really slow. It's really, 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 really slow. Um, but it does work, and it does allow you, it's kind of hard to see, but this is on my x86 Ubuntu machine. I'm running a QMU instance on the left in the, in the screen. You can see me cutting CPU info, but it doesn't, you can't see it. But, there's a RISC-V QMU instance running on my x86 machine. The inside that is an x86 instance running Colibri OS, which is the smallest GUI OS I could find. And, and it takes a few hours, like an hour to boot, but, but it'll eventually get there. <laughs> um, and it's really hard to get a screenshot because the screen redraws, you can see it midway. So it's, you have to really time it. But, but it's, it's kind of cool. Um, and so it is, like I said, it, it kind of shows, it's a full-blown OS, I mean, a full-blown architecture. It can do anything you want. It's not some tiny little embedded specific thing. RISC-5 can, can scale the whole way. And on that note, distributions. So Fedora 29 is at stage four, and I think out of stage five stages they have. So it's not like the top-notch support, but it's fairly well supported. Uh, this is a demo uh, one of my colleagues, Tish, has set up running on the Hi5 board that I mentioned earlier, running Fedora with GNOME, the full desktop environment, and about 85% of the Fedora packages built, are, are built and installable. So, I mean, it's pretty impressive that this thing, that still doesn't have mainline kernel support, can, can boot a full distribution. And Debian's kind of in the same boat. They have around, uh, RISC-V has a similar number of packages as everyone else. Um, and so OpenSUSE was still missing, but I've heard there's some work going on underway on that as well. So uh, most of the big distributions now are supporting RISC-V in, in some way. Uh, so Yocto also has support. It's probably not that interesting for a group of SUSE people, but it, it's very big and embedded, and there's a meta RISC-V layer, and you can build your own distributions using Yocto, all targeting RISC-V. So some general, uh, general other overviews. So GCC support and Binutil support is upstream, it works, it boots, everything's great. Uh, there is still missing optimizations, uh, and you see this a lot in, re especially really small embedded. Um, the code size, is just not that comparable to some other architectures. It ends up quite big and clunky. 
And so a big part of that, well, there's two parts of that. One is the lack of bit manipulation in RISC-5. There's an extension for that that's not, not frozen, not ratified yet. Um, so, and you end up needing a lot of instructions to do what in other architectures are quite simple. But another problem is GCC's optimization. It, it kind of goes too far in just blowing out way too much code that if you really kind of look at it, it doesn't need to do. Um, so a lot more work, or some work at least, is required on that. And interestingly, the GCC and the LLVM teams are talking to uh, architects, RISC-V architects, about the vector instructions. So vector instructions in RISC-V are much more complex than, than most other architectures in that they're flexible length and they can change and, and there's a lot of compiler work going on that will need to go on around that as well. Uh, and people like Richard Henderson and stuff like that are, are working with GCC and LLVM to, to kind of plan how it's going to happen. So it's, again, it's another, it's a, a great example of how this architecture is based on hardware, but also how, how software is going to use it. It's not just created by some hardware guys and dumped out there and everyone has to figure it out. It, they're working with the whole community to get something that everyone will use. So GDB is another big one. It's somewhat there. Um, you can debug Linux. You can't debug a Linux application, which is a huge pain if you're trying to work on Linux applications. So there's some work going on by Jim Wilson, doing a fork, who has a fork that works, but it's not upstream yet. Um, GLibc, like I mentioned before, is only actually there for 64-bit. So if you want to use 32-bit GLibc, there are patches going on, and they should be merged soon, I think, but they're not there yet. Uh, there's some other stuff, Java, if anyone's interested in Java, Lua, and GDK3. So, so there are still some kind of big core language or development tools that aren't there. Uh, Zephyr is there, if anyone wanting to run an RTOS. Um, it's the, well, the Linux Foundation's RTOS, so, so that works on QMU and on device tree based boards. And then some other stuff. Uh, other languages that, that aren't fully there. There's no optimized version. So JavaScript works on, on RISC-5, but there's no optimized, optimized version, like the way that, that say ARM and x86 have, where people spend a lot of effort on getting every little, little second out of running JavaScript. So, so the next big steps, uh, like we said, getting the kernel upstream. When there's weird forks of the kernel everywhere. It's hard for everyone to be on the same page. It's hard for distributions. It's, it's just a hassle. And it, it really was, until very recently, quite difficult to get started. You had to know not only the, the place to find it, but then there were five different branches, all called RISC-5 for this version, and, and one of them didn't work. And, and see, it was a real hassle. So step one is get this kernel upstream. So you can take a mainline kernel, and you know it's going to work, and you know it's supported. And so we're on the way. Like I said, so the 4.19 kernel will have QMU support, and the 4.20 kernel should run on hardware. Uh, and then on top of that, we have other things to enable future board development, future development, as things like SBI, stuff like that, that is going to be required. And then toolchain support is always critical. GCC optimizations, uh, I think it's going to become more and more apparent as people try and start using this more and more. If the, the output of GCC and things like that is, is too bloated or, or too slow. And GDB is another part of that. It, doing work without GDB is way too hard. And so, uh, this is my last slide. Um, so, I just wanted to talk to everyone. There's a plumbers uh, mini conference coming up at Linux Plumbers in Vancouver in November. So we have some confirmed topics, as you can see there, and some proposed topics. And, but if anyone else wants to propose anything, if anyone wants to come, if anyone wants to talk about it, um, sign up, go to Plumbers, or you can talk to me after this. Uh, it should be interesting, and we're trying to get more involvement in the community, more people's input. Um, yeah. And review stuff, send patches, all that as well, if anyone's interested in RISC-5. Does anyone have any questions? No? Okay.